By now, I had actually been executing my idea of selling collectibles online and buying more to sell. And I was selling quite a few. It was kind of fun, really. But I was doing this and working on making the show, planning promotional things to do, and there were still little things that needed to be done in the train car. I couldn't do them all during the day because I'm still working my job. And I need to keep creating stuff. I could still do this the way I always have been, but I was trying to step up the number of things that I do and up my game as far as making this something that could be sustainable, possibly. Because if I was going to execute all of these things to try, I needed to do more. So I hired a paid intern. He's going to get college credit for helping, and after interviewing him, there were a lot of skills that he had that were actually going to be kind of helpful down the road. But for right now, I need to get more money coming in. So the first thing he's going to help out with is cataloging all my collectibles. So weighing them and taking pictures and setting them up for shipping and stuff like that. Another thing that I learned for the storefront side of the business, I follow this guy on YouTube who's actually in like northern Wisconsin and he talks about how he does stuff like this on his YouTube channel. And one episode that he posted was him going to a shop that was going out of business and buying the display racks and things like that from them. After I saw that, Mary Joy and I were walking down State Street getting a coffee and I just happened to see a going out of business sign in a shop window across the street. We went inside and the woman said that she was retiring after 60 years of doing this thing. So we asked her about buying some of the display racks and she actually gave us a great deal on them. Now we actually have a few more things to build out the space. It was a really interesting coincidence. If I had never seen that video, I would never have thought to do that. I'm Tom Ray and this is American Bandito. <laughs> After moving those racks onto the train car, I actually had to run to go to an interview at a local coffee shop with the people that I meet today. I'm Olivia Wisden, the founder and CEO of Underbelly. And I'm Elizabeth Wisden, and I am the art director of Underbelly. From time to time, I do a nearby local search on Instagram just to see if there's any interesting artwork that's being posted in the Madison area. And I try to find new things to check out. I can't remember exactly, but I think that's how I discovered Underbelly. One thing I thought was interesting was that they would post messages in their Instagram stories about stuff that was happening around town. So when we met, I asked Olivia if she could explain all of what Underbelly does. We are a startup. We're launching our app in June, and we provide recommendations to local inclusive businesses and offbeat events. It's more of kind of non-traditional venues, smaller organizations that it might get easier to get lost. Within Facebook or Isthmus, it's hard to find. So those are kind of the events we highlight, as well as the local inclusive businesses is kind of the core. Ultimately, we want to be able to provide personalized recommendations. So the idea would be that how you navigate Madison and what you're interested in here, that when you visit Chicago or Detroit or New York, that we can provide recommendations of like what's happening, where you should go, um, or where you might be interested in while you're in those cities. So that's our future, or what we're, we're building to. And we took a very non-traditional route, uh, especially in the startup world, to kind of start getting our name out there and to start kind of doing what we're interested in, and that was we created a weekly zine. Now, the zine, is it a print zine or is it an online zine? Because I found out about you from Instagram. We are a printed zine. We do post it digitally as well. Mainly it's a, it's a 200 print every week. We have about 20 drop-off points around town. And each zine highlights, we usually try to get at least two uh, visual artists. Ideally, we like to include like a poetry or a short story. We highlight either a local business or organization or an individual who's kind of trying to do something interesting in the community. And then we list our highlighted events of that week. When did this get started? The zine is really, well, we're about, we're 10 weeks into the week cuisine. That was kind of a spur of the moment decision. I was meeting with actually the people who print our zine, Chroma Press, and I went to them for a very, more of like a one-off project that I was interested in. What was the project? We were trying to print drink coins, like bowling alleys, small town bars, like when you can get a drink chip and it's like valid for one good free drink. And like, they're like very popular in like old school bowling alleys. Like my hometown bowling alley has it and so we're like it'd be fun to do a throwback and like if you find an underbelly drink chip you get a free drink somewhere so that was the original plan was because they do printing on like all things and then talking with them we basically by the end of the conversation decided that we were gonna have a weekly zine and I came home to Liz and was like hey great meeting we're gonna do a weekly zine and then so your reaction was like, you didn't know she was going out there to do that. No, by no means. I was like, oh, are we? No. <laughs> like, 
Like, okay, first tell me, what are you talking about? What's a zine? Oh, you had no idea. We had no idea. <laughs> she was like, you know that thing you brought home when you were in Denver? Yeah, that's a zine. And I'm like, okay, we can work with that. That's cool. I'm like, what is this going to have? What is this going to entail? And we knew from the get-go that we wanted to have the highlighted events, but we had no idea for, like, layout structure, any, what we really wanted to, like, achieve entirely with it. But then about three weeks in, we finally got into, like, our groove of being like, okay, we really want to be able to highlight artists and give them a voice and, you know, allow them to have a platform on something that's a little bit more, like, mass-produced because 200 prints of a you know small local artist they can't always get that we want to be able to give that voice to you and that platform it gives them a little bit more of a stretch rather than just being able to have one individual print at an art gallery so they're able to reach a little bit more audiences that way but our interaction with the artists and like finding them has been knowing like our own connections and our own network as well as going to different events and just kind of like spreading the word about underbelly and being like you're an artist awesome here's the zine that we're doing if you'd like to contribute we want to be able to showcase you like i had mentioned i found them just using instagram and they were talking about an app they were working on so i wondered what made them choose to expand into making an app well there's certain features about that just pair well with, with an app versus a website. So we do have a website, it provides our weekly calendar, it, it has the recommendations for local businesses, it already has a bit of the personalization, like there's a quiz in there that you fill out as you, like, you know, prompts you with like five questions and it kind of gives you a list of places around Madison, but it's a little clunky. The way that, the way that we envision the app being used is that it's easier to sort through events that you don't have just a giant list of events that it's much easier to that you can see it further out than a week in advance that you can create a profile and save things so that if you're interested in an event you can come back to it there are things such as like if you're na- if you're out and about wandering madison you can pull up that and see what's close to me which right that's not feasible with a website so it's more of the fact that there's just certain features that we think are going to make it really actually useful beyond just being a resource for people who are visiting the city for the first time. We started off as what we thought was a travel app and kind of really pivoted to, we're targeting locals. This is an app for you, to, for Madisonians to use. And that if you're visiting Madison, you find us, great, because there's a ton of really interesting things on it. But really our marketing and our reach goes to local people. How are you going about that? I mean, yeah. you were sitting at home, you're an art director, <laughs> she comes home and says, we're going to build a zine, now you're making an app. I mean, neither of you programmers, right? Well, that's the other thing. So we... So basically the zine was a very, let's do this, this sounds like this is on brand, where it's very kind of alternative and interesting and non-traditional, and we kind of, what we've has kind of embraced with the underbelly, but with that being said, that was not part of the kind of rollout plan. We had no real marketing strategy. We had some, we, we knew about social media and events and stuff like that, and we wanted we knew we wanted to do a guerrilla marketing. So. We've been building that just under a year now, but we do have a development team. So I had we brought on a developer um, last year. He was super early on um, when we still didn't have a name for the app. We didn't have an really idea of what we were. It was pivoted from a very different startup, and so pivoting to this and then kind of it fe- he fell in line with what our interests are, what his expertise are, what he sees for a, kind of a future. Um, really, just kind of fit in line. But with that being said, it wasn't until about six weeks ago we brought on three more developers. So now we have a team of two front-end developers and two back-end developers that are working closely with us. Basically, it was the decision that say that we're more of the you know about it. Give them everything in the in realm of-, of design in terms of working with them for layout, what I think, navigation, that sort of stuff. So I can give them ideas. I'm not a designer. I'm not even an artist. So like having a weekly zine, having all like this is very outside my wheelhouse. And I'm just very fortunate to have amazingly talented people on my team who can, when I suggest something, they're like, we'll make it work. And that they're, they also trust me enough to be like, this is this is freaking crazy. Like most people, when I told them we were gonna launch a weekly zine on top of building an app, they were like, weekly? Do you, sh- that's a lot of work. Do you- are you sure you wanna do weekly? And it just felt, it was one of those of, it feels right, we need to make a splash. A monthly zine is not gonna make a splash around Madison. If we're gonna do it, let's do it. And that's kind of the, kind of the route we've taken with everything is, if we're gonna do it, let's do it. I get that. Sitting around and thinking about it is one thing, but doing it, I find at least for me, is more a way to learn what really works and what doesn't, and then I can change it up if it doesn't work. 
So yeah, I dig that they jumped in and said, heck with it. Weekly printed zine. So with that, how are they doing it? And how many people do you have actually putting content into the zine? Well, it ranges. We have the two artists. Ideally, we highlight visual artists and then one, some sort of written artist. But then the rest of it is us. But it has been a great partnership with Chroma Press because they have highlighted so many like ways that we can use color and just like change the dynamic of digital art by in the print form. Because the two, Emily and Maggie, they're incredible artists as well, and they just have like such a great vision and understand our vision like in the first few weeks those are really pivotal times of being able to understand how to work with these printers like like the actual physical printers like the riso printer like how do you actually work with those like what work like what aesthetic works best to be able to get our point across and so they had a lot of really great contributions to altering the artwork and yeah. then we eventually kind of built a system and a design for okay, ourselves. The system is, uh, <laughs> is it's like very specific but very big. Like we have a list of themes which are words and we they are always intentionally vague. So like we've had uh, Rome, we've had Ride, Collide, Mash, Grow. So like kind of you can go any direction and basically we just play m just try to list as many different situations that we can use that word. So for like, and we give that as well to our artists. So we encourage artists, um, we either reach out to artists that we kind of feel are on theme. And that's through just like now with our Instagram that has been super helpful of like following a bunch of artists, working with them. So like when I have a theme, I, there's certain artists that automatically kind of trigger my mind and then I reach out to them directly. And I'm like, hey, I think this would fit really well for this theme. The other thing is we have artists reaching out to us and then they're more interested in creating original pieces for a specific theme. But we do that because it does allow for the most fun and most interesting <laughs> zines in the sense that they feel random, but then there's this really faint line that ties them all together, as well as it allows us to kind of lead a direction. Usually it goes, if something makes us laugh, it's entering the zine. Like if we can throw out something that is so absurd but still on top on theme, we're like, okay, that's a winner. Putting out a physical zine costs money and time, and so does building an app. So how are they affording to do all this? We did receive a grant specifically that was helped to get our app launched and to, for our marketing. Where was the grant from? Um, Doyen. Okay. They're great. They um, specifically work with uh, women entrepreneurs and people of color. For any business that is potentially scalable, they really want to work with you to make that happen. And so they provide grants, small grants, to kind of give you that that foot up to, to launch, which has been a, it's been a saving grace because we would not be able to do, even though Chroma, we work with, so closely with Chroma Press and it's not, you know, it's super reasonable, but doing 15 weeks of it is just, it adds up quickly. What was your experience like writing a grant? The Doyen was actually pretty, it's, they try to make it, they don't want to make it complicated for you. They really do want to just empower you to, to be able to be that foothold to help you achieve this passion or this dream that is a business. So for that, they don't make it as complicated or, or as convoluted as some. I've definitely read some grants where it's just, they pigeonhole you or it's it's very pretty easy, not an easy application process. You really have to describe what you're gonna use the money for and where your vision is, how you can expand. And they do have criteria of what you have to meet, but they lay it out in a way that's really approachable. It takes, it takes several hours and you know, but you can save it and come back and all that good stuff. That actually like helped us be like, okay, what are we? What is our goal of Underbelly? What like, yeah. What is our five-year plan? And so, like, I feel like that was kind of like the point that it pivoted of being like, okay, cool, this is this is a real new startup for us. Like I said, I discovered Underbelly searching local posts on Instagram, but of course, that isn't the way that they plan on people finding out about them. Olivia tells me what they've been doing so far. Honestly, we don't play do as much as neither neither of us are kind of like whizzes at social media. The first like six months was really us trying to figure out like what does. Our, underbelly look and feel like and within the scope of social media within the scope of our website and all of that and we finally kind of got a we finally have a vibe I would say that we finally have an aesthetic like this is what we this is when you see us you're like oh, okay I get it but mostly what we do is we just try to follow people that we're in, like follow businesses that we're su supporting every day on our stories and this is something that's been quite popular surprisingly we highlight roughly three events that are happening each day and we usually just like hey these are what this is the time it's at this is where it's at and then we always just tag whoever's kind of hosting the event and supporting it and that's been a great way to kind of 
just extend our networks because surprisingly probably 30% of businesses and artists and musicians reshare the story and since it also fits a very specific style that has extended our network kind of tenfold from what we otherwise would have had. Other than that, we have great partnerships and like relationships with uh, Majestic and the High Noon. So we've been fortunate enough to give, be able to offer like ticket giveaways so that we do a little bit of promotion with that. But that's really when we have things that we can give people, we promote it. Promote it just through your network or do you actually like do paid promotion? Do small paid prom- promotion, like $2 a day. We, we're bootstrapping this. Right. So like definitely the goal, you know, our, is to... It, however, in the next few months, figure out what our next game plan for financing Underbelly. And because we understand as a startup that it's going to take some time to really build our network, uh, which is why we've been doing more specifically like the zine and these events is that we don't want to be an app that you just have on your phone and forget about. We want to be something that if you have us, you'd love us. Oh, that made me realize that the app would need to be hosted. And usage and data and downloads, that adds up to the cost. The traffic of people using an app and its functionality is a whole different factor to put into a budget. How much do you think your cost will be to host an app? I mean, that's a different thing than having a website. Amazon Web Services, it's quite affordable these days. Now that might change if suddenly we get like 5,000 downloads here in Madison and we have people using it constantly because then it just takes more servers and more, it just takes more space, but it's, pretty affordable provided that you aren't outsourcing your development. That's when it really starts adding up really quickly is when you have a developer that you're paying that's not part of your team because of all of the maintenance that's required. Having that many users or like how do you plan to after the grants yeah. are done? Yeah, how, how do we make money? Yeah, yeah that's fair. That's always, like, that's, uh, so we have a kind of a couple different routes that we're planning on going. The first is having premium business accounts, which is different. It sounds I dislike the name because it sounds similar to the Yelp ads, but the difference is that it's going to be uh, give businesses more access to users who are interested in them. So ideally, businesses can then promote their events directly on the app on their business account. They can promote their happy hours. They can talk about if they're, when their patio goes out or if their hours change. Or I mean, it'll be a way for businesses to actually reach the users who are interested in them in a much more direct manner. So that's kind of the one direction is having those additional accounts that we're kind of we're ho- we're working closely with businesses to actually build features that they're looking for versus just kind of creating features and be like, hey, you want this. The other is that we really think that because we're diving into the personalization side of things, we're quantifying aesthetic, figuring out why do people like certain restaurants, why do certain businesses feel one way, why is it that Nashville and Merchant are both cocktail bars on the square and they serve small plates, but they're very different restaurants and they're both very Madison, but very, serving very different crowds. And if you don't know that, then your experience in Madison changes drastically if you go to one versus the other. So our hope is that we can then start identifying trends of, hey, I'm, a coffee, I'm building a coffee shop and I really want it to be a place where people sit down and work. What sort of features do I need to include? Is it having just a ton of outlets? Is it most important that you have a bunch of family-style seating? What are these things so that way you can start identifying these trends to be able to work with cities and work with developers to really help build local businesses that not just survive but thrive in these communities? So that basically becoming consultants to cities and developers to kind of help support the local community is what we're our ultimate goal. To build off of the question about how people will discover Underbelly, What do they think would appeal to most people about what they're doing? I think there's two sides of it. I think people really relate to the idea of trying, like they understand the pain of trying to find local businesses that they want, whether it's while you're out navigating a part of town that you don't know, or if it's you're in a whole new city with no one that you know, that idea of wanting to support the local community, but having no idea how to do it, or having no idea how to identify a local chain versus a small mom and pop diner, that pain, I, like that struggle for that people have, I think that resonates. And then the other side is I think that they get what we're trying to do for like the also like just the art side of things. I think people understand. They appreciate the fact that we are, we lean into kind of this absurdity, this playful, fun brand that we're playing with and this idea of like supporting, we're supporting cool shit. Like it's kind of these offbeat, weird communities that can kind of come together. And we try to kind of really dive into that with our uh, social media, with our website. And if that's a mix of 
this mixed media feel of like real photos mixed with this really graphic feel mixed with a zine. I think people don't see that in like the tech world, especially. I think they're really used to this really like clean, minimalist, almost anti-design design where it's a ton of white space, very clean lines, and people are really used to that. And we're kind of coming through and being like, no, we're gonna do our own thing and have fun with it. And so I think people really relate to that and enjoy that, hey, I might not get that joke, but I appreciate the fact that you're even making a joke. I would say that people, I think they're really striving for community. And I think that they're getting that. And I think with the zine, we really have delved into that a lot. With They're able to recognize, like, hey, this isn't just them creating this. Like, this is an artist who is writing this, who is contributing to this. And so they're like, OK. Like, they have, like, a sense of, like, authenticity, knowing that, like, they actually are doing what they say that they're doing or what they want to eventually be doing. And so I think that we're gaining a great credibility with the network here in Madison because they're able to recognize us and we're, you know, reaping what we sow. I think it's been a great way to bring us all together and we frequently talk about how, you know, apps feel very disconnected and like you're just like viewing a screen and then it like transports you someplace. And I think that's what people want to see. And I think that's been a really great revelation within our trying to navigate what it means to be like a part of the community as well as in this broad app that eventually wants to be a part of all communities. They'd really like to know what they could do to improve it. So go to their website at exploreunderbelly.io. If you're enjoying this podcast, head on over to my site at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list and find all the links of the other stuff that I'm doing online. Or even if you just have a question or would like to contact me about something, that's AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. Thanks for listening. And until the next episode, so long. Mm-hmm.